Hello family, I'm glad to share with y'all once again. I'm gonna be honest, Wednesday I was working on my notes and I just felt this draining. Like, it, it was so hard to put together. It was so hard to find a scripture. I'm like, I, I didn't understand it. And then the next day, and by the way, always be open to learn from every situation because God's going to teach us through those things for us to teach others and to grow us ourselves. But he had something that I had to wait on to get true understanding of what, what I needed to share. And he had a completely different message. So last night after work and after the fellowship, I, I went home and... And he gave me this word, and man, it's just, I felt his presence was just got, got in it, and it, it went by. And this word is sharpen your sword, part 10. Cured through rebuke, through reproof. Let us pray. Lord, I just ask deeply for your presence that, that, that you already know what needs to be spoken. That you know that person that needs to hear this. You will open the hearts for all those people. That the stubborn, hardened heart stretches open. And your truth pours in. And that they would seek to live according to your truth. And I just ask, just, just, just anoint, speak. You know the power of what needs spoken. It's just like this word, it was hidden from me until the right moment. And I just ask you to, to come down at this moment and speak it, that our trust and glory is all in you. For I am just a man. All the wisdom is yours. So we just ask that you are lifted up, that we are renewed through this word, and that you are glorified, and that I just decrease so you increase. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we all know this. We're right here, Second Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped, for every good work. And we share that. We hear that so, so often. But yeah, do, do we live it? Because if, it, if it's actually going to correct us. And we're reading this word. We shouldn't be looking for something that's going to feed us. Or justify our feelings. Negative feelings towards others. No. What this word should do. Is revealed to ourselves. Where we are not living according to God. And. It should also reveal. How we should disciple. Others. It should also reveal. Where. We need to protect and guide our flock. And what sort of people that we need to protect them from. And this is the way of training in righteousness. Guarding your heart. Guarding your conscience. Being sure that you are following Christ. In all that you do. And that your motive is not to please man. Not to please yourself. But only to please God, who knows whom and what is best for your conforming to Christ. 
And what's going to pull you back? What's going to cause you to wander astray? Because in reality, that's what the enemy is trying to do. He'll use anything and anyone in order to do so. He will use the weak in faith and sneak in those who are disguised as sheep in order to pull you from the truth. And how should those who are truly in the spirit be walking? What is this reproof? The, and, and whom should we do it towards? Let's look first at Titus chapter 2. Know that verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. I say this first. Those who teach, those who rely fully on the Holy Spirit, know your calling. Know what God is equipping you to do. Because that's what the scripture is supposed to do. Bring you competent and equipped for every good work. And what is our first good work? Reconciliation. It is to tear down the strongholds of men and help them come to Christ. And that tearing down the strongholds, that process, it can it can hurt. Look, Proverbs 27 5 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse. Are the kisses of an enemy. One who is full. Loves honey. But to one who is hungry. Everything bitter. Is sweet. And we can look at this two different ways. See everything that is not good for us. Can taste sweet. When, when, when we are. Hungry. Hungry for the world. And yet, if we are hungry for God, this word should be bitter to us because it's for correction, reproof, and discipline. So, if we are hungry for God, it will be, it should be bitter. But as you grow and you train yourself into this, training, denouncing ungodliness, and worldly passions and to learn to live self-controlled upright and godly lives see that's that's what it's supposed to do that's why we receive grace so we can live into this so as that hunger comes you're gonna rejoice in this word and you're gonna rejoice when someone comes to you and shares what is not what what we don't want to receive hey god is saying hey this is in the way of your walk and whether they receive you or not, see, that makes the the next choice of what God tells you to do. I mean, sometimes it says to bring it, if, if, if you're talking private and they don't receive it, then you uh, go before the church council. And if they don't receive the church, then you remove them from your fellowship. Which is hard in this culture because you just go down the street. Because that's why it says the churches should be on the same judgment in the same mind. Because this system of division is so dangerous. Because instead of recognizing and bringing that shame into us. Because the action of reproof. 
we are bl- instantly blaming on the other guy. If 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 the churches were of uh, one mind as we as they should be, the people could be like, okay, so what's what's wrong with me? What what needs to be worked on in me? But the mind that is still in the flesh instantly says, what's wrong with them? See, that's what God needs to is trying to work out of us, okay? Because it's supposed to grow us into examination, and that's what. I talked about Colin. This is what God has instructed me to do. It's not to feed your hunger to see everything wrong with the world and the politics. No, that's not where God has me. There's plenty of people do that. And sometimes that's not a good thing. Unless it's fully guided by the Spirit. If that's someone's calling, that's good. But otherwise, people get so hungry for that that they're not examining themselves and getting worked in the spirit themselves and the more that we feed into that the more we're actually assisting them to build on this foundation that they call is for Christ where it can become so glued together that it's going to be hard to escape and that's how Satan just works. That's that's how he deceives people. Look, why am I saying better is open rebuke than hidden love? Because if you are truly walking in the grace and the spirit of God, your whole walk should be about God rebuking you. Rebuking ungodliness, re- renouncing ungodliness in your life and your worldly passions, revealing it to you, convicting you, showing you, hey, this this is gonna hold you back from me. This is going to also show others this this false version of me. And what happens with that false version of me? What have we shared? It says to be careful in the word, saving you and your hearers. So we we have to constantly be careful how we are taking this in. Because any wrong idea that's confused by our former way of life or the traditions of man, what it will do is cause us to walk into something destructive for ourselves and our hearers. Look. So this is the scripture and all this is to train us into what we need to be. But if we don't even see scripture that way. We are already in this dangerous trap. Of destruction. So. Then what's what's the hidden love? Like I said, God's sharing this. He, like, like my own child, I don't want him to get into drugs. I don't want him to get into alcohol. I don't want him to just touch the stove and burn himself. I don't want him to light a match and just throw it on the ground. That's destructive to him. It's harmful. It's risky. And who am I to just allow it? Knowing the result of what's going to happen. And if I don't study the word myself, you know, then I'm putting myself at that own risk. See, there's... It says right here... um, Well, I'll get back to the one that that I was thinking of. But I will share 2 Thessalonians 3.14. It says, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take not of that person, and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. 
like with that not having nothing to do with them because we have to walk in such a way that helps that's according to scripture otherwise like i said they're just going to build on this foundation that they think is christ that's actually sinking sand and that sinking sand is just going to lead them into more trouble and they won't be able to find Christ because they have this false form of him. And as that happens, they feel torn and tossed and lost and without hope. Look, and if we see someone living... In a way that's not according to Christ. See, as it says in Romans 1, 32. Though they knew God's righteous decree. That those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them. But give approval to those who practice them. So, what this is sharing is. If we show if we just follow along with somebody rather than following Christ, because we should be following the spirit, not following the flesh. We think we're doing a good thing or supporting them, but if, if the Holy Spirit didn't tell us to, we're just pleasing the man, and we're actually hurting them. We are, see, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And that also has two understandings. A good friend that rebukes you when you are not walking according to Christ because he knows that that's going to lead you to destruction. And the second is faithful are the wounds of friends as in these wounds are faithful because we just allow them and support them because we think somehow that that's going to bring them to the true Christ. Even if we're, we're going amongst them to something that's stirring them from the truth. Do you think that perhaps is going to help them understand God? It's not. See... When you reproof, when, when when you rebuke, it's like I can't have any part of this. You know, I can't I can't follow someone who is not walking according to the spirit. Because that's starting to form in our minds this have it your way, Jesus. And also knowing as as James says you believe there's one God, good for you. Even the demons believe and tremble. And the same way also when it comes to prayer, right? You think that just because someone prays with you, that they write with God because, or if they lay hands and pray with you? Look, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 5 calls that a basic teaching laying of hands. Even if it's not in our culture, it's a basic teaching and it still says that you're at risk of falling away from the truth unless there was true evidence of fruit in your life. You see, you can lay hands on somebody and still have not truly rooted into the true Christ. The more, and we think we're helping them. But the more that we just, you know, treat them like a brother in the sense opposing what he says in Second Thessalonians 3, if they don't obey or live according to this word, that, and, and that we show, hey, you don't have to follow the Spirit. You can live as you want as long as you believe God exists. Look, it says, have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. But in your heart, do not regard him as an enemy because he doesn't understand. 
but you're doing it as a brother because you're showing them I can't approve of this life. I can't approve of what you think is part of Christ and that you will still go to heaven because what you're doing is you're leading them to hell by hiding what is truth. You supporting their bad decisions. Showing... Because it shows this process of warning them, warning them, warning them. Because if it grows into it, and the more they grow into it, the more, because God's trying to call them, the more they feel guilty. And the more they feel guilty or shameful, because, well, look at Adam and Eve. As soon as they, you know, took of the fruit, they felt ashamed. They were hiding their nakedness. They were hiding from God. And they didn't even know to hide from God. It was a natural instinct. So, what is, what are they going to do? The natural instinct is they're going to live this life hide from God, and if they hide from God, they can't get filled up from God. They're not going to want to spend time in prayer because they are walking the shameful life. And by us not sharing anything with them about it, we're causing them more harm than good. Because it is through Christ that we have true life. And when we live for ourselves, as Romans 2 says... We are still under his wrath. The spirit of God should be transforming us. Renewing us. And Jesus says clearly. The Bible says. A friend of the world. Is an enemy of God. We don't want to be an enemy of God. And by us allowing the things that are not of God. And let me say this clearly. Actually, I'll go to first I'll go to first Corinthians five. So no one can, you know, attack me. I'm gonna read the scripture first. First Corinthians five. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexual moral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idol idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed. Or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So... If, even if you don't go to church, you don't do any of that, if you claim the name of God in any form in order to protect you from building in a foundation that is hard to break from, it is our obligation, as we read in Titus, to exhort, to reproof, and to correct with and to discipline with all authority and let no one regard you. It is our position to do so. Otherwise, as Paul says, I 
have not blood on my hands, for I gave the whole counsel of God. If we lack in this, and they fall, in death, separated from God, because we did not feel it was necessary to share truth. And they, thinking they were right with God, were destroyed. We have some guilt on Judgment Day because we didn't love them enough to warn them. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. A lot of people treat their brothers as an enemy because we just show acceptance of their life. And remember, a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So we are giving them The kisses of an enemy. And then, let's look at this. One who is full loves honey. They just want to itch their ears. They just want sweet. Something sweet. They don't want what convicts. They want what makes them feel good. They want their Bible show coated with sugar. Look. And they become so full that they're not open to receiving true word. And then that also. But to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. But everything's bitter if you're full. So bitter that you're not going to taste it. So bitter. That you will have no room for truth. You will just grow. And wonder why you can't overcome. Because you got comfortable. And will not take in what sets you free and those friends who show allowance of that because they don't have the courage or the action to speak up or they're worried that I have to stay here amongst them in order for them to come to Christ that can be more destructive than good because you're because like it says in Thessalonians I have nothing to do with that person, so they'd be ashamed. And yeah, they might be ashamed of you at first. They might say, oh, it's you. But then, they'll start to think about it. And God might speak to them through it and be like, no. This is the example that we must set because that's part of all scripture. This lifestyle, what we read in Second Corinthians or in Corinthians five, that's part of scripture. And that's part of reproof. And we have to be willing to of that. Why? Because Matthew 5, fifteen says this. Um, 15. Matthew 13. Ah, 13, 15. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart. And turn. And I would heal them. The 
the more that they're not warned or shared any of this, the more they can't be healed because they're not going to listen. They're going to be stuck in bondage because our example and our action shows it's not important. In the same way, Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof are wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. See, the rod and reproof, the, the wisdom. It's, it's, it's the action that we should be showing our, our children and those in the truth. And the discipline, because it's it's a training, it's a process. But that discipline is not to just simply rely on the law. People can listen to this message and say, hey, you're being legalistic. It's all about following the law. No. Because I tell you the truth. If you... Jesus says, if you broke, bring back the old system that he tore down, you are sinning. So, in that same way... Anything that is reliance on you or your former way of life. Is sinning. Legalism. is sinning. What am I saying? That we need to be amongst those who walk by the Spirit. Who have spiritual fruit. And that's the word that God kept giving me. Spiritual fruit. The reliance on the Holy Spirit only. Yeah, you can have worldly fruit. And people can deceive. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You might think, hey, they praise God for prayer. But. And, and with certain things. But that doesn't mean that you must be amongst them. You must have ask the Spirit. <coughs> because there's God is at forces, especially if you feel pulled away from your sheepfold so much as a baby Christian. This is why. This is why. Because... The enemy once is still trying to throw darts. He's seen you accomplish things through the Spirit in many ways. But then you overcame in Christ. So now he has to try something new. Hey, the world can't pull you away anymore. So now let's use the church. And we're going to look more at Scripture to show that is truth. Well, first, let's look at first Tim Second Timothy two. Um, I believe it was Second Timothy. Let's see, Second Timothy four. I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is th to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away. From listening to the truth. And wander off into myths. As for you. Always be sober minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul's words are very specific I have finished the race 
I have kept the faith. What are you saying? Does that mean I can turn from the faith? Yes. The Bible says you can turn from the true faith. And all these people that are trying to bombard you. Look. If you are walking in Christ's righteousness, if you're walking in the Spirit, the lion's mouth will stay closed. But, if you went along in the flesh, you are at great risk of being devoured. In the same way, the story in 1 Kings 13, and the prophet the man of God performing such miracles and then getting told, do not go the same way that you came. And then he, he was fine with the worldly king, but deceived by someone who claimed to be a prophet. And because of it, he was devoured. Because he went off the path that God put him on. But we have to be very careful. If there is no evidence of spiritual fruit, do not go among with that person. Do not journey off. Stay with your flock. Okay. Let's look at Proverbs. 9 8. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. Look, so if they scoff. They will hate you. You know, don't don't give more than you should. We, you know, he, he God talks to the, in, in this Timothy. It says with patience to exhort, be ready in season and out of season. But all this is also knowing that there's people who who have accumulate themselves teachers to suit their own passions wandering from the truth and that we have to keep a sober minded our mind clear we have to keep a clear conscience we have to keep guided by the spirit let and if you are truly truly guided by the spirit You are a wise man. And you will become wiser in instruction. Because you're receiving it. And if you teach a righteous man. And he will increase in learning. Because one who is righteous. Is open to learn. From one who is hungry. From. One who is hungry. Always has room for more. Proverbs thirteen eighteen. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. He who regards reproof will be honored. Look, so if you neglect discipline, if you neglect walking in a way to to guard your flock, if you are easily pulled away and not standing firm, you know, some may be double-minded. There's actually two that Christ really showed me 
Uh, yesterday he gave me these two verses. And I'm like, hey, these are opposing. What is going on here? So Titus 1, 7. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word he has taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Rebuke them sharply. And in this root, rebuke. If they do not receive the rebuke, what does the scripture say next? Separate. But, also know, as we read before, don't even eat with such people. Keep your distance until Christ says otherwise. Otherwise, who's going to get fed more? You or them? You. Because if you walk outside of God's territory, you will be easily devoured. Because it, you, you serve either the spirit or the flesh. So if you're walking outside of the guidance of the Holy Spirit to please somebody or to support somebody, you will be easily afflicted without protection of, of God because you did not pray, you did not ask. And when you ask, sometimes we just quickly say it, Hey, I prayed, so that means I'm good now. No, you have to seek his will in the prayer. And this is so important. Otherwise, and that's that in 1 Kings uh, 13, that the man of God did not seek God in prayer. He just went along. Hey, you say you're from God. Okay, let's, let's I'm going to come over to you. I'm going to go off the path that God told me not to go off. And I'm going to eat with you. Led to destruction. Look. Not devoting themselves to Jewish myths. And the commands of people. Who turn away from the truth. To the pure all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving. Nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God. But they deny him by their works. They are detestable disobedient, unfit for any good work. Unfit. And what do we do? Because we are supposed to reach such people. But we are not supposed to reach such people in a way that makes them feel like their walk is justified. If you sense no spiritual fruit, then it's not one you following Christ now is it let's and yeah and this this is part of that walk because and this is talking about legalistic but also greedy drunkard we must be hospitable lover of good self-controlled upright, holy, and disciplined. And hold firm, trustworthy word is taught. Look, so now here's the opposite one. So we got one that's that's legalistic for their own gain. And uh, Jude. Chapter 2. 
chapter one. If I stop passing it, there we go. Um, there's only one chapter of Jude, by the way. Anyway, three through seven. Okay, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for the condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So he had to stop what he was going to share in order to say, hey, you got to contend for the faith. There's people who will creep in. There will be people who creep in to stir you from the true faith. And they deny the Master and Lord. They pervert the grace of God. So you got these who are legalistic and then these who live like the world but still say they're child of God. And they're setting the example for other people. And they're not producing fruit. And they're making many feel that they're going to be saved. But in the end, God, can, Jesus will say, I never knew you. You can see why our silence can be so troubling. How our silence destroys. Okay. Um... Proverbs 15.31 The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself. This is the one I was going to share earlier. Despises himself. But he who listens for reproof gains, in, gains intelligence. Look, so it say here. Okay, you you gotta listen for reproof, because yeah, if you ignore instruction, you despise yourself. And if we are showing this this lifestyle for ourselves, not waiting on the Lord or, or, or speak or or look to what He says, how how we must live and walk and protect and guard our faith. But it's saying that we truly hate ourselves if we are living this way. We are sending ourselves to destruction. Remember that verse? It said, save yourself in your hearing. We, if, if we blindly do not listen, and we, if we feel righteous our, uh, uh, based on our own works or, or what we do or because we go here or we do that or we pray or rather than being humble. If we try to seek our own guidance or the guidance of others, rather than God, we are not walking into humility. Humility comes before honor. And look, but he who regards the poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline. But he who regards reproof will be honored. So you have to regard reproof and be willing to be disciplined. Willing to be open to listen. Because that's where humility, that, that's connected to humility. Reproof. Humility. Humility is. Yeah, you're gonna. Li you're not gonna be proud. I already know that. I don't need to hear. I need. I don't need to listen. I read Bible. I pray. I do that. Because of that. First, as it says, you despise yourself. You are putting yourself at risk, even if you think you are holy. 
you know, examine yourself. Why? The next part. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom. The part before that, before humility, the fear of the Lord. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask God before I just blindly follow, before I blindly do. Because what do I know? And I just, you know, I know he's in control of everything. Even when I'm in a hardship or a trial. I have to fear the Lord, not the trial. Not the calamity. I can learn from him. And gain wisdom in it. Alright, so. Let's look at uh Okay, Galatians 5, 4. Also, and we have to warn, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. And we also have to be willing to listen what that law is. There's some who justi are justified because they think they have to dress up to please God. There's other who justify how they dress, how, you know, certain scripture they follow, and yet they don't love like Christ loved. And, you know, Christ, he rebuked. He, if they didn't misrepresent God, he let them know. He even called them a brood of vipers. He, he said they were full of dead man's bones. You know, and, and, and that's that's how Christ regarded those who did not live according to his word. What does that say for our own walk? You know... If someone didn't devote and dedicate themselves fully to Christ. I mean he said. Well go sell all your stuff first. And then follow me. And you know the apostles. They had to leave the jobs and then follow him. There was an expectation. Before following. There was. Getting rid of whatever's going to get in the way. Before following. Which that's going to be a process afterwards because he reveals stuff that we blindly do not realize that's in the way of serving him. But what I'm speaking of is that Christ was not going to have someone amongst him that's not going to be dedicated. Therefore, who if that's true about Christ, and someone claims his name, and we follow them, are we following Christ? See, these are the things that we have to examine and think about, because otherwise, there's, the blind leads the blind, and the blind leads them to the grave. They fall in the hole that the enemy has shoveled for them. And they all fall together. See, that's why we have to seek God in all we do. We don't understand how serious this actually is. Let's look at um, Second John. Second John one eight through eleven. Okay, um, watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, there you go. If you do not abide in the teaching, if you are not reproved and exhorted. Through scripture. And you go on ahead. 
you're not abiding in in Christ. But but here it says, does not have God. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. If you see someone just carelessly, they may pray, they may speak scripture, they may do this, that. If they are not living, if they are living in the flesh, trying to please the world, trying to be the world, they don't have God. Though you could say, yeah, because what's the first thing Jesus says? Even when he rescues them from their accusers, sin no more. He speaks of repentance. Those who have truly re received the grace of God have this practice of repentance. And they were not going to, they will not boast of what the world does, they will not boast in their wickedness. That they are guided by the Spirit. And at the end of this message, I'm going to reveal why that is. But look, we must abide. If we do not abide in the teaching, we do not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So look, that's part of that support. We think it's so good. But there is certain instruction that we were given to be sure that we are walking in Christ. And if we fail at any point in that and show that acceptance making them feel right with him do you not realize how much blood is on our hands because of that there you say well there's forgiveness and all that yeah there is but do we personally know how much we've piled up against ourselves I can't even honestly say on judgment day that I've done good enough I can't say that about myself you know I seek Christ I seek his truth but I'm not gonna say I'm right with him because I'm not going to say based on my own human perspective. And that's where I, that's part of humility. It's, it's by your grace that I'm right with you. But it's nothing I've done. And I can't go before him and say, hey, but I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. No. I am be more like, when did we feed you or when did we visit you when you were sick you know just because I've done good just because I seek his heart doesn't mean that I'm walking perfectly as I should there's always conviction. There's always something that's holding us back. And the more I try to tell myself that I'm right with him, especially without examining myself, the more I deceive myself and possibly become proud. But, so... Let's continue. Um, I don't even know where those thoughts came from. But Acts 20. Acts 20. 28. 
Pay careful attention to yourselves. Oh, hey, 26 is where it's talking about. I testify to this day that I am innocent of all blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Look, early in your walk, there will be people who will speak that, that it's going to look like they, they're going to look the part. But they're going to try to draw you away. Like I said, if you're drawn away from the flock, you're going to get devoured. There will be many who will draw away the disciples after them. It will look innocent. It will look like one time. But I testify this. If they are not in the spirit. If there is not evidence of fruit. Beware. You will walk into a den of lions. There will be people who will draw, who will sneak in among you and draw in among you. Christ said it. Paul says it. The apostles say it. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. He worked hard to be sure that they stand firm, that they were within God's narrow path with tears, with, with fighting, because with, with tears, so he had to say some stuff that he didn't want to stay. And he had to protect them. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Right? Yeah, 4. 1 Corinthians 4, um, 14, okay. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though, and what he's speaking about is those who are, think they are right with God because they follow a certain teacher. That they're reigning with God. And, and in this chapter, in the last, he reveals what you should be actually going through. Anyways. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. And so your accountability partner will be like your father in Christ. And Paul treated him like that. Those who God gives us, we, we you know... As a mentor, we, we treat in such a way. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Look, but you see this. Here's another part that we need to take ground of a true teacher. For though you have countless guides in Christ, God, you can learn from everybody in your life. We can get to this point where we'll be like, well, I listened to him and him and him. I don't need anything else. Look, he's telling them, you have countless guides in Christ. Countless guides in Christ. And he's not speaking of the false teachers that are creeping in. Because he says in Christ. And many of us don't want to receive that. Many of us say, hey, I already got him. I don't need anybody else. I'm filled up. I got enough. No. You know, me personally. Okay, I teach the Word of God, right? Twice a week. And I gather with a body on Sunday. Uh, and I listen to a word outside of praying, spending time with the Spirit and the Scripture. I listen 
to a pastor of the word that I test. You always test. I tested to be sure they're in the truth. Whoever you're following, be sure to test them. Test the test their teacher beforehand. Ask the spirit, okay, are you in them? Before you go amongst them. Anyways, daily. I get filled up by someone daily. Outside of that. And this is so important. It doesn't matter how far you are in Christ. How wise you think you are. We just read about that. Give a give instruction to a wise man and he will build a steel wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. We spoke of that. Someone who's truly in Christ. They know that, you know, even criticism, it's good medicine to them. Correction is good medicine. It helps us truly in our hearts. We need it. We need to stay teachable. The, mo the moment you're not teachable and you think you're so right, especially if you're reading this section because you follow a certain teacher. Your faith is in them and not in Christ. Your faith is based on what you were taught but not in what Christ is teaching you. Teaching you. Continuously growing. Learning. As your mind is continuously renewing. So. Um, yeah. And we. So let's continue. Yeah. Uh, for I became your father. I urge you. Then be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy. My beloved and faithful child in the Lord. To remind you of my ways in Christ. As I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant. As though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills. And I will find out. Not the talk of. Of these arrogant people. But their I will, I will find out. Not the talk of these arrogant people. But their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. But in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? Or with love and a spirit of gentleness? But, so he's saying. Okay, I have to look out for for, for the flock. I, like, like a spiritual father. I got to watch who's in my children's life. And I have to share with you. And he does name people. Like you have to be careful. You got to... Stay from them. We, we, we've heard many of that in this message. You have to keep yourself from them. And the more you support those type of people. And, and they could be spiritual bullies. And what kind of example is that given to people? What, what are you teaching them by who you're accepting? Um, but anyways... And that is, and it's saying, yeah, the kingdom of God does not, it's not talk. Just because they talk it, just because they speak it. it it's those who rely on the power. You have to follow those who rely on the power. That will help you grow in the power. Not thinking that they are better than you, that they walk with you. And they encourage you. And they, they don't see that they could stay better than you. But they know that you, through the power of the Spirit, God could have greater things for you than them. That's who you should be amongst. That's who you should learn from. That's who you should follow. And then, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? Or with love and the spirit of gentleness? So, like I said, there's, there's two interactions. And and he's saying, hey, you, you, you guys got to check this. You guys got to take care of this. Because I want to come among you. I don't want to be that father that has to go there to discipline you. No, I want to share in fellowship and love. I want to share in fellowship and love. Um, okay, let's look at Titus 
three. Oh, first, second Thessalonians three six. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not accord according with the tradition that you receive from us. And that tradition is the reliance of the Holy Spirit. Paul constantly said that, hey, um, I'm walking this way. Call upon the Spirit. Don't rely on man. Don't rely on human effort. I speak, I speak lofty. I don't speak persuasive speech. Persp yeah, persuasive speech. I don't want you to trust in the wisdom of man, but of the power of God. See... That's part of the tradition. It was fully reliance on the Holy Spirit. Those, and we talked about, look, those who say, you know, this is my church. I don't want any, you know, I love my church. It's Christ's church. And we just read how Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 4 about having different teachers, different people teaching them. We need to encourage that because it's the unity of body. And remember, of same judgment, same mind. That's how we grow with a flock. Not fighting over sheep. Look, who is walking in idleness? It says to keep from. If they are not calling upon the Spirit, See, well, this can talk about idleness in the sense of just laziness. Not working hard and, and striving and, and doing all you can as for the Lord and not for man. But in the spiritual sense, day to day. Because all scripture is for correction, reproof, and discipline. This idleness, this acceptance of such people, it will destroy you and your hearers. Paul had to rebuke Peter. Okay, so before you ask, okay, so you're saying that. You last week you talked about going within the darkness to be the light. And now you're talking about get rid of those in the darkness to have nothing to do with them. No, it says warn them as a brother. Treat them like a brother. This is out of love. And this is for their own walk. This is because they have this idea that they are right with God when they're not. That there's no evidence of fruit. And if they continue to grow in that. They're at great risk. That's what I'm speaking on. See we. Jesus sat with sinners. But he did not become a part of their sin. He didn't talk about it. He fellowshiped and taught the word with them. He taught the ways of the Father. He spoke to them to follow him, follow his new ways. He he they sat with him and learned. Okay. So first Timothy five I don't know if I read this. I have, I'm, we're getting to the bottom of this. Okay, First Timothy 5, 20-25. Okay, now, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. Doing nothing with partiality. So look, it's saying to rebuke people who are in sin without prejudging them, but in the sense that they will not receive. Not assuming that they won't receive. 
But bringing it before God and the council and seeing how it goes. Not rushing, but being patient with the situation. Because sometimes when you get caught, it takes a minute to boil. I mean, you could say, hey, let me pray with you. I, God revealed to me this struggle. I know you, you don't want to receive it right now. Here, let can I lay hands on you? Can we pray about it? Perhaps the Spirit of God can dwell. In, and, and as we're praying, you can see that our heart cares for you. And, and, and that we know that you can come to the truth through this. And it's something that's holding you back from the abundant life that Christ promises. But in that sense, it's, it's to help them overcome it. But it's up to their choice after that. See, after a little bit of prayer on the situation, when everything gets quiet, that regardless if they rebuke it the first time, if they refuse to listen the first time, I mean, that, that gives them time to see, hey, this, this, this isn't the hope of glory. But if they still are hardened, that's, that's when you're like, I can't. You know, we, we have an operation that God has. And, when, and if they repent, they confess, forgive, repent, receive them. Receive them. This is a process that's needed. It's, it's very important. Otherwise, people are going to continue to grow in it. And think that it's okay. You know, I, I, I saw a post today. And it said that because of the grace of God, we can live disobedient and still be righteous. And that that's what happens when we are not warning and sharing with the word. People start to think that. And they can think they can live their whole life disobedient and not grow fruit and still be saved. And what's going to happen on that day of judgment to them? That's why it's so important to get in your word. How many brothers and sisters... Because our lack of discipline in the word, do we affect them and, and their walk and risk their salvation? Okay, so. Titus 2. Oh yeah, I did that one already. Proverbs 1, and we're getting, we're getting through this, we're almost done, Proverbs 1, how long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. You wonder why a lot of people can't remember scripture and, and, and truly understand it or desire to understand it? Because a lot of us don't want to receive his reproof. And we're going to end talking about what his proof, reproof truly is. But that's that, that repentance, that's the surrender of yourself. That is nailing your passions and desires of your sinful nature and le leaving it there on the cross. Are you going to turn to that reproof? That you choose sin or Jesus? Look, follow those. See... Those who practice righteousness as he is righteous are of God. But those who continue practicing sin are of the devil. It doesn't matter what they claim. And if you follow them, you're following the devil. You only go amongst them if God tells you to. 
We must seek those who desire righteousness. Okay. Anyways. And then we he pours out a spirit in us. See, I know personally my time of coming to the Lord was me constantly running. Constantly fighting it. Constantly trying to overcome it by my own efforts. And I would not listen to him because I thought I knew best. And I would not listen to his reproof. His first reproof when I overdosed. Suffer from me instead. Get off the hamster wheel. Stop this cycle. No, just just let me die. I hate my life. I hate what I've done to it. There's no hope outside of it. I could have just listened to him. You know. But you know what? Faithful are the wounds of friends. These wounds that I have. There's a third way I can look at it. Those wounds that I have. I can share with you. And teach you how to be faithful. Because I can tell you. That you can overcome it. Because I know it. Anyways. And I will make my words known to you. Because I have called. And you refuse to listen. Have stretched out my hand. And no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel. And would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. And that's, you know, we get to this point where, where the distress, those, the anguish, those are times where God's trying to have us come to Him. And sometimes we do it. And then that's those times where we're like, well, why isn't God answering my prayer? Look, you refuse to listen. And sometimes he shares his calamities and you're just going to man for it. You're going to human wisdom rather than trusting and learning from him. I will mock when terror strikes you. Stress and anguish. He's trying to discipline you. He's trying to get you to know that you need to fear the Lord and, and, and understand His control and power. And we need to be a people to share this. We need to be a people to share these things because that's what's lacking. No one fears the Lord because no one takes it seriously. Everyone just wants to think, hey, God's grace covers me, I'm good. I go to church, I'm good. I believe God exists, I'm good. Do not be deceived. That's Satan's plan. What? You look at the end times? What does it say? One will come up and claim to be Messiah. Perform miracles. Look. He is going to look like the savior of the world. He's going to try to make you think he's Jesus. You can be deceived. If you do not look into this word. Okay. Then they will call upon me, and but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because God doesn't want <coughs> to just be... Look, you just want you to be secure, to live forever, have peace, have comfort, not go to hell, not have anguish. That's not what he wants. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want to be used. He wants a relationship. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. 
That's what it says in Romans 1 also. Because it's, he handed them over to their heart's desire. This is what you want. You don't want me. You don't want my ways. You don't want my people. Okay. And you know, they call me diligently. They seek. This is also speaking when you're in hell. When it's too late, you're going to seek him. Just like the rich man Lazarus, he's calling upon him. The rich man, he's like, Lord, Abraham, you know, my tongue's on fire. He's like, it's at least four of my brothers. It's If they didn't listen to prophets, what makes you think me going up there, they're going to listen to me? He... Seek him before it's too late. This is what happens. Listen now. Listen to the heed of his people. Listen to his counsel. Don't just take everything like a natural cause. Ask the Lord to show you in everything you're going through. Okay. With that, 1 Corinthians 3, 2. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So when we actually have these times, these trials, these hardships... And so we're not condemned along with the world. There is a risk that we can be condemned with the rest of the world. There's a chance. If we do not receive his discipline. If we. Proverbs 3.11. My son. Do not despise the Lord's discipline. Or be weary by of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him. Whom he loves as a father. The son in whom he delights. And I say this because he reproves him who he loves. Hebrews 12. It says he disciplines those he loves. If you are not facing the Lord's discipline, you are illegitimate and not his child at all. Point saying is. If you do not have conviction. If you are boasting in the things of this world. And you don't feel bad about it. You're not actually his child. And those who think they are. And you support them. And, and, and go amongst them. And you are going against the word. And you are making them think. That they are right with God. Sometimes. We we have to you utilize the Lord in everything we do because we don't when when we just blindly do things we do not understand how much we're actually hurting people. We call it the world calls it judgment. I call it love because I don't want you to suffer eternity in separation from God. And if I keep my lips shut, that's what I'm doing. If I just support your life and act as if you're of God just because you claim. Without me asking God and I just blindly go along with you. I am supporting and making you think you're right with God. And allowing you to build your former life unto the foundation of Christ the Lord disciplines us so we are not condemned he uses his children to discipline us so we are not condemned because God reveals to us what's going to keep us severed from him What's going to keep us from growing in Him? What's going to keep us from desiring in Him? And we have to understand that. If you truly, truly love others, you are going to treat them the same way that God treats you. Because 
If we don't reprove one another, nor rebuke, we're going to continue on the path we're on and be at peace with it until the point when Christ returns and said, none of it was for me, it was for you. Do you want the blood on your hands? Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. Man, I just ask that you grow us into this way, that we truly nurture ourselves with the word, protect, not blindly just do things, but we seek your counsel because we don't know what's good and evil. We don't know what's right or wrong. We don't know about how... How even our little actions can affect somebody's walk and their life. So, grow us deep in the spirit. That we may love as you love. That we will learn how to treat those of the word. Or those as you do. Disciplining them. Caring about how they walk. Because we care about where their soul goes. That we don't just get comfortable just because they claim. For demons do that. But we follow the example of the word. As guided by the spirit. Not prejudging. But looking through the spirit. Seeking the truth. Bringing the disobedience to obedience. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters. God bless you. I love you. Have a good night.